everybody, let's stand and sing page number 288, I Am Resolved, page 288, on the first verse, I am to a unique Tuesday night service. I'm glad that you came to church tonight. I, I can see it in some of you. Uh, you feel like we just left, and we kind of just did. And I'm glad you came back for church here this evening. I'm looking forward to the service that we get to have uh, with the Shields family. I haven't had a lot of time to get to know them, just a, a brief little while before church, and I've enjoyed it. And uh, so I'll say a little bit more uh, about uh, Brother Matt here in just a moment. But I'm glad you came to church tonight. And uh, let's have a word of prayer as we open the service. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd meet with us this evening. It is, it is a special privilege to be in your house with one of your servants and with his family. Uh, I pray that you would please uh, speak to all of our hearts. And, and Lord, please pour out your spirit upon this place and uh, fill Brother Matt with your Holy Spirit as he, as he speaks to us this evening and his family as well. And uh, Lord, give us a good service tonight. We pray these things as we ask it in Jesus' name. And amen. You can be seated. And I'll let you remain seated, all right, while we sing our next song together. Let's turn to page number 180. Isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful? On the first.
we'll go through the announcements here very quickly. I want to leave as much time as we possibly can uh, for Brother Shields here in just a moment. Wow, I've got too much junk in my Bible. I need to get rid of a whole bunch of that stuff. Um, all right, so upcoming events. We have the homeschool meeting on this coming Friday at 1 p.m. at the camp, and uh, then the men's fish fry on Saturday at 2 p.m. Now, we'll begin eating at 2 p.m., but I'm understanding that uh, we're going to have to have some guys show up and do uh, some preliminary cooking, I suppose. So uh, we'll have to talk about that, fellas, and get that a little more organized on what time we need to start rolling in so that we can get everything prepared. And uh, so be, uh, be, uh, be communicating with me on that, if you would. Uh, this is new to me, all right? So I don't have a clue how it works. I just know you bring fish and fry it, all right? So uh, you'll have to help me with some of the logistics here. What else, what else, what else? Baby shower went well last night. Miss Naomi preached at that uh, yesterday, and I understand there was great revival and great conviction, so <laughs> sounds like everybody had a great time. And Miss Miranda, it sounds like uh, maybe came away with a few things, so I'm glad about that. Uh, it's wonderful that we're able to do that for them. Don't miss uh, the opportunities to be out door-to-door soul winning and bus visitation uh, this Saturday at 10. And then I'd like to, if I could please, add a couple things to the schedule here very quickly. need to have a couple of meetings uh, upcoming. And uh, so on Sunday night, this coming Sunday night after church, if I could meet with those that are involved in the bus ministry, uh, I'd like to, uh, to meet with you. We'll, we'll do it as quickly as possible after the evening service this coming Sunday night. And then Wednesday night, uh, those that have been involved uh, in the teen ministry or would like to be involved in the future uh, in the teen ministry, uh, then I'd like to meet with you this coming Wednesday night after church. If we could do that, please, that would be wonderful. Our missionaries of the week or our ministry of the week uh, are the Grabanskis. Wonderful to have them as a part of our ministry, and I'm glad that, uh, that, uh, that we uh, can pray for them. I hope you have been uh, throughout the week. I've got one prayer request, if I could pass this to you. Uh, I know that there are many things that we could be praying for, but uh, right before church, uh, Miss Kathy Stallman handed this to me, and some of you may be aware of it, I'm not sure, uh, but this is the first time hearing of it. So uh, Becky Norton, I guess at one point uh, they came and uh, sang here at the camp meeting and things in the past, and um, she had an accident at work, I believe it was sometime late last week, and uh, she has had multiple surgeries and had to have four fingers amputated, and uh, there is a uh, long recovery ahead for her. And so let's be in prayer for Becky. I think, Miss Kathy, did you say she's 22 years old? All right, so younger. And so we need to be in prayer uh, for Becky, if you would, please. Matter of fact, let's just pray for her right now. Could we do that? And we'll pray for her. Dear Heavenly Father, I, I pray for Becky. Lord, I, I cannot imagine going through what she is right now. And Lord, I, I pray that first of all, you would, you would, you would ease her pain and, and comfort her. Lord, I pray that you give her body the strength to heal. And uh, Lord, that you would give her spirit the strength to heal. I pray that you would give her, her, her peace and comfort from above. And uh, Lord, I pray that you would help those that uh, are helping with, if, if there are more surgeries to come, sound like there might still be something going on today even, but Lord, if there are more procedures and things that need to happen in order for her to recover from this, then Lord, I, I pray that you would give the doctors, the surgeons, the specialists, the nurses, everybody that's involved wisdom and discernment and guide their hands and their thoughts as they try to help her uh, through this. And so, Lord, please be with the family as well. I pray that you comfort their hearts and give them strength. Uh, Lord, I, I think of, of little Isaac uh, Belcher just now that, that he, he came to mind. Uh, Lord, I, I pray that you'd continue to help him to heal. Uh, last night, of course, a little scare there, and I pray that you would help him to continue uh, to recover and strengthen. We pray these things as we ask it in Jesus' name, and amen. Um, you know, Brother Elisha, where are you? I texted you a little bit before church, and then I was at the campground and didn't get a chance to read your response texts. And so give me a quick update on Isaac. How's he doing? Good. All right, good. Good, good. Uh, if you are or not aware, uh, are or are not aware, I'm not sure, but uh, uh, yesterday evening, uh, little Isaac started, uh, uh, he, he was showing signs of a fever and different things, but then it spiked in an instant, uh, and he went from 99 to about 103-something in a very short amount of time and had a seizure, a minor seizure. Uh, I say a minor, he had a seizure from it, uh, and, and so they, they didn't know exactly what was going on. The Belchers rushed him to the hospital late last night, and uh, so I rushed over there with them to, to, to uh, spend time with them. I hate it that you can't go into hospital rooms still. 
and I wanted to pray with the little guy, so we had to pray uh, with him uh, through FaceTime with mom, and uh, so uh, it sounds like he's, he's mostly back to normal today, but they ran some blood work and some urinary tests and things like that to try to figure out exactly what was going on, and so pray that uh, everything comes back normal, and uh, it did come back normal. Good, good. So no major infections or anything of that nature. Good, all right. And fever still okay today? Good, wonderful. So keep praying for little Isaac, all right? And my wife told me late last night he got home and he was so excited to see his cup. <laughs> you know, how do these two-year-old minds work? I don't know, but I'm glad. That's right, that's right, priorities. And so I'm glad he had his cup. I don't know what cup that was, but I'm glad he had it. And so let's continue to pray for Brother Isaac. All right, here's what we're going to do. Um, we're going to hasten along and... Uh, I'm going to go ahead and have uh, Brother, who's back here, Brother Andrew, uh, come and lead us in one more song here this evening, and then uh, we have a few things that the Shields are going to do for us tonight, and so uh, they have a presentation to, to uh, give us a look at their ministry, and uh, then he, he mentioned that the family sings, and so when he said that, I said, well, I tell you what, we definitely want to have the family sing together, and I'm looking forward to that, and of course, he's going to preach for us, so after this song, Brother Matt, uh, I'm going to turn it over to you and the service is yours, all right? And so we'll have you start your presentation, introduce your family, sing, preach. You can do it all in whatever order you want, all right? And uh, so I'm looking forward to that here in just a minute. And so I'll introduce him in just a second, but I want to give you a heads up that that's where we are in the service. All right, Brother Andrew, come and lead us in a song. Let's all stand to our feet. Let's turn to page number 75 on Jordan's Stormy Banks. On the first verse. I mentioned just a minute ago that I, I barely know Brother Shields and, and his family. Um, you know, Brother, Brother Matt Stallman called me. I suppose it would have been right after uh, we accepted the pastorate here. And, and uh, he, he, he told me that, you know, the Shields uh, had been scheduled uh, under his pastorate and uh, under his interim pastorate. And that uh, he said, you know, we, we, 
we want you to have full veto power over whether or not they come. And so we talked a little bit about the shields, and he shared some of his burden for you all and uh, shared a little bit about your ministry. And I thought, boy, it would, it would be a shame to not have you come. And I, I'm, I'm honored that you all are here. Now, they're on furlough. You can help fill in some of these blanks for us, Brother Matt. They're on furlough uh, here for just a little while, have uh, been in Aruba uh, for about six years or so, and, uh, but have been on the mission field for longer than that. Uh, is it maybe 20 years or so? All right. And so, uh, so I, I'm sure he'll tell us a little bit more about it. But I tell you, j- just, just sitting down and speaking with him, and, and, and Brother Matt does the same thing. When I, when I speak to these families... Uh, I told my wife on the way here on that short trip from the camp to the church that uh, they challenge me and they convict me. And, and, and these, these folks live by faith. And he made a comment earlier that, that, uh, that, that stuck with me. And, and he said, you know, there, there is something to be said biblically about counting the cost. And we do need to count the cost before we make any major commitment. He said, but over... Over time, I think sometimes we count the cost so much that we stall and never do anything. That's convicting. And, um, and, 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 and Brother Matt Shields and his family, uh, God has confirmed through his work in their ministry that he's behind what they're doing. And they often take a leap of faith in a lot of the things that they do. And, and God has confirmed it uh, in their ministry that his hand of blessing is upon them. And so I'm challenged and convicted already just in the short amount of time that we've known each other. And uh, I hope that you'll listen and open up your hearts to this family and allow God to speak to you while, uh, while Brother Matt Shields presents his work and shares his heart with us this evening. So, Brother Matt, why don't you come, and I'll turn it over to you at this time. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you for being with us. Appreciate it. Okay, good evening. Good evening. I am I'm blessed. Uh, I'm a little bit shocked to see as many people out on a Tuesday night. <laughs> you know, we've scheduled 80 churches pretty much on this uh, trip, and uh, we put it together a few months ago. Uh, we were in Aruba for six years. The kids couldn't leave the island. They were illegal. You know, being in Mexico so long, we got used to crossing the river illegal, you know. And for the Mexicans, we say están mojados. They're wetbacks, and what that means is they got wet crossing the river, you know. Uh, so we ended up going to Aruba, and I'll explain some of that in a little bit. But basically, my wife and I got their own um, uh, visas, I came in with a minister visa. My wife came in on a priest visa. So the fact that she preached last night kind of goes along, you know. There's, I know there's going to be some questions with that one, you know. But uh, anyway, we finally got our permanent residence back in June. And uh, under that permanent residence, we were able to get paperwork for our kids. And so for the first time, they're legal on the island, and now they can leave. Before, they were protected by international law, which meant they couldn't be kicked out. But if we took them off the island, then we couldn't get them back on. So we were running the risk of separating the family. So because of that, we haven't been to the States in a while. It's been about six years. Put together this trip as of basically November. And so uh, 80 Church has been over backwards and allowed us to, you know, on a short notice, visit them. Uh, Forty of those churches are new churches to us. And uh, you all are one of those that allowed us to come. And uh, whenever we talked to uh, Brother Stallman, uh, he said, well, come on a Tuesday. And I really didn't even have to ask for it. And I worked out perfect because it was supposed to be in Quincy, Illinois tomorrow. And then we'll be up in Chicago on Friday and Thursday. And then Saturday night we'll be in North Carolina. Sunday we'll be in two churches in North Carolina. Next Wednesday up in West Virginia. And it just kind of keeps on going. Uh, but we've only had two churches out of 80 we're willing to change the schedule. And so we usually don't even ask it because in the States people don't talk about that much anymore. I remember the olden days when I was a kid and my dad would be on the road. Uh, that many churches would have Tuesday, Thursdays, Fridays, Saturdays, and they just change things around. But that's almost unheard of. And so I want to thank you for being here today, especially knowing you came to listen to missionary and knowing you came to see a presentation. Uh, you know, if it was a, a Eaton service, you know, I could understand why you were here. Uh, but the fact that you're here to see a missionary, that means a lot to me, and I really appreciate it. And so thank you all for showing love for the Lord, love for your church, love for missions. And I would thank the uh, Stallmans for the opportunity. Uh, we've known them for a while. They're a special family for us. We've... Um, I don't know how many years. Uh, there's a couple things, you know. Uh, my adopted daughter in Mexico married a guy that Brother Stallman took down from Poplar Bluff, and I still kind of hold that against him. Uh, but other than that, you know, it's been a really good relationship. And so, actually, Brother Stallman, I wish we had time to get into it. I was telling Pastor Lou about it, but it's uh, based off some of his ministry that we're in the Caribbean right now. And so, I would have never considered leaving Mexico uh, years before I got into studying uh, countries without missionaries. And because of their passion and some of their studies, the Lord led us to leave Mexico and go to a place where there was no one else. But we'll get into that in a second. Uh, Pastor, thank you for letting us be here, especially not knowing us. And uh, I know that uh, 
Most pastors, when they step in, they just wipe the calendar and they wipe the missions plate and they kind of get their own guys in. And I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to be here. It's been a joy getting to know you tonight. Looking forward to getting to know you better. And uh, there is much we could say. You got, I got to say, I'm, I was raised in Mexico, so I got a Mexican clock on the inside. And I don't know if you know what that means, uh, but that means that we don't use a clock. <laughs> so uh, we are very guilty of, uh, especially uh, in Mexico, out of all the Latin American countries, we're very guilty of, you know, letting time slide. And so I'm going to try to not do that tonight. I want to use every minute I can, uh, as best we can. But, you know, we're not here, and we want to preach here in a little bit because we believe that that is, you know, that should be the essence of any service, right? But I know you all got a lot of good preaching. And if you all have had Brother Stallman behind the pulpit for a while, you all get a lot of good missions preaching. I know that. Uh, so we're here, and we want to challenge you, but we specifically want to give you information as to what's going on. And we want to let you know what's happening in our part of the world, what ministry God has called us to. And uh, I'd like to clear up any doubts or questions at all. Now, just to uh, clear this up also, we were here, I was trying to think, Brother Matt, if it was five years ago, six years ago? I don't remember when it was. We came for a fellowship. Nine years ago? Okay. It's been a while. But we were in, I don't know if we were in a service or we came at the tail end of a service or something like that, but we were here just in passing, and then we went over to the gym, and y'all played volleyball, and we had supper. Uh, but it was kind of in passing, so I really didn't get to know anybody, so we're really excited to be around this time and be able to get to know you a little better. Uh, before I forget to say it, in the back, we do have our prayer cards, and we do have some prayer reminders. Uh, we got some little, they're meant to be bracelets, but I kind of give them out as bookmarkers, Bible markers. And there's coins. Aruba uses a square coin. It's the only country in the world that still uses a square coin, as far as I'm aware. Um, it's about 28, 29 cents of American dollar. But we give them out as prayer reminders. So if you're willing to pray for us, we'd ask you two things. Sign up on our email list. We're trying to revamp our email list, get a little more modern if we can. That's not my cup of tea, but we're working on it. Uh, but sign up for our newsletter list, and then take a prayer reminder. You know, Put it somewhere where you can see it. Uh, and it does work. You know, I'll tell you a story real quick. We were in North Carolina, Gastonia, North Carolina. And after the service, I'd done the same thing with prayer reminders. And uh, this was a couple years ago, a few, more than a couple years ago. But anyway, one of the older gentlemen in the church, about 80 years old, come up to me after the service. And he said, I don't know who came up with this. He said, but this really works. He said, a few years ago, a missionary came through, and he was giving out some old coins. He says, and so I grabbed one. I promised to pray for him. He said, every night when I empty out my pockets, his coins in whatever change, pocket knife I have, he said, so I pray for him every night. He said, I'm going to take one of your coins, he said, and I'm going to put them in my pocket every day. And I'm going to pray for you every single morning. He said, I'll pray for you in the morning. I'll pray for that guy at night. I kind of chuckled, said thank you, walked away. When I got in the van, my wife said, what are you chuckling about? And I says, well, what he doesn't know is I'm the one that gave him the other coin last time. <laughs> and so I get morning prayers and night prayers, you know. Uh, so it does work. We had another lady that said she took her coin. She glued it to her wash machine. And she said one day they were moving, and they were getting rid of the old wash machine, and she went running after the movers. You know, hold on, hold on. i got to get my coin off the wash machine and glue it to my new wash machine. Uh, really what we're trying to do is just get you to remember us. And so anything at all we can do to make that happen. Uh, we want your prayers. I know missionaries say it all the time, but this is not something I just say. Uh, the best thing you can do for us and any missionary is pray. And that's, that's the truth. And so we ask you to truly pray for us. Uh, and we'll try to give you some of the burden that we got tonight and some of the things that you can help us pray for. Uh, but before we get into that, let's go ahead and get the kids up here and my wife. Uh, we're missing one of our uh, kids. My uh, third uh, daughter, uh, my third child, uh, has got a fever since yesterday. And so she's uh, back in bed uh, over at the Stallman's camp. And so she is uh, not able to be here. She's 15-year-old, Sila. Uh, and then I have two nieces traveling with me. We have Joanna and Kayla. Joanna's with us here tonight. Uh, she's not going to sing tonight. She just had all four of her wisdom teeth removed this last weekend. And her sister's back in bed with huge swollen jaws. She's had a little bit rougher time because she had her four removed. They're twins, and so apparently they have to do everything together. Uh, but anyway, uh, they're with us. Uh, they speak English, and uh, Kayla and Joanna are their mom and dad. Uh, their mom is from Michigan and South Carolina. Uh, their dad is from uh, Chalchocoyo, San Luis Potosí, Mexico. And uh, he's been a pastor there at the church for 20 years, one of our uh, closest pastor friends. And so uh, she's not a blood relative, but, you know, the girls call me uncle. I'll call them niece. And so we, we really enjoyed them. Uh, they had to come renew their passports. And so we said, we'll help you out with that and then just travel with us a few months, get a chance to see the states. And so it's a joy to have them. So we're missing two of our group tonight. But let me introduce uh, my wife, Naomi. My, Na Naomi's a Missouri girl, so y'all can, I guess, be proud of another Missouri girl. And uh, I met her in North Carolina, Ambassador Baptist College, back in 99. 
she ran from me until 2000. Finally, I caught up with her, and she was convinced I was the right guy after a while. Uh, we got married in 2002, right after she graduated with a music degree there at Ambassador. Uh, I finished the next year in 2003. Uh, Caleb was three months old when, uh, when I graduated, and we got to Mexico three months later. And so Caleb's our oldest, and then got Tirsa over here. Caleb's 19, Tirsa just turned 17. Sila's at home 15. Enoch is 14 almost this year. Uh, Judah is 11. Mercy is 9. Yosef is 6. And Belle's in the nursery. She will be 3 next week. And so the Lord's given us 8 kids so far. And I do say so far. You know, we are missionaries. We believe in big families. And uh, we uh, have a couple adopted children that we've uh, raised in Mexico with us for a while. Most of them are out of the home now. But we do appreciate the family God has given us. And everything we do as a family. I got two brothers and one sister and three adopted brothers and sisters in Mexico. My dad's been on the field for 44 years. My grandparents were down in the 60s. And uh, all of us seven in the family are in full-time ministry. And one of the first things they ask my dad whenever they get around the family is, how did you do it for all seven of your kids to want to be in full-time ministry? It doesn't happen all that much. And uh, one of the things that I as a child can say is, dad always involved us. And he always taught us, it's not my ministry, it's our ministry. And it's not something that you just watch me do, it's something that we do. And so we were raised. I don't remember the first time I picked up an offering or played an instrument or taught a kid's class. You know, I just, my earliest memories were always being in church. And that is something I've always wanted to do. And so it was really not much of a question of whether there was a calling. It was almost something, a responsibility that I wanted to be in full time. And so we praise the Lord for family. We don't know what God's going to do with our kids, but we are uh, thankful for them. And we pray that the Lord will continue to use them wherever that might be in the future. So we're going to sing a song for you tonight. Um, you know, people... When you're a missionary, I remember a few times down, my grandfather was a Southern Baptist preacher. I'll get into a little bit of story here in a second. But uh, I've had people walk up to us down in South Louisiana, South Mississippi, Alabama, and say, oh, wow, can I shake your hand? And I said, yeah. And they said, we've never shook a hand of an actual missionary. Uh, because Southern Baptist churches, usually you don't see missionaries coming through. And um, sometimes on the mission trail, you can be kind of applauded, and you can be made a big deal out of. And I believe we should make a big deal out of the people of God and everything. But the honest truth, folks, is we're... We're no big deal. Uh, we're simple vessels. Uh, we're downright almost useless vessels most of the time. Uh, but it's all because of the Lord. And it's only because of his grace, his mercy. It's only because of his strength, his guidance. And so today we want to sing a little song, I'm sure you know, uh, reminding you that little is much when God is in it. In the harvest field now ripen, there's a work for all to do. Hark the voice of God is calling to the harvest, calling you. Little is much when God is in it, labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crown and you can win it if you go in Jesus' name. Little is much in the name of the Lord. And you know, so many times we think we can't do much. And you don't realize that what little bit we might be able to do in a human way is great when we put it in the Lord's hands. And I'd encourage you to continue to think that way and allow the Lord to do great things through you. Uh, and I want to dive into the presentation. We are old-fashioned guys. We don't use slides anymore because Walmart doesn't print them. 
Uh, but we probably would if they still did. Uh, I am, uh, I'm not a complete enemy of computers. I just don't know how to use them. And so uh, we don't do a video. One of the reasons is most churches, you know, give you five, ten minutes, and that's the extent of what you have, and a video works. But then we got churches that give us a whole hour. And uh, it just, a PowerPoint gives me a chance to kind of slow down and speed up, although I've got to say I'm a lot easier at slowing down than speeding up. But uh, I'm going to try tonight to get through this as quick as I can, but I do want you to be aware of what's going on and what's happening. Um, like if I stepped in here, Pastor? That's fine. And uh, as we get through this, I, I would like to emphasize this point. If you have any questions at all, I mean, with all my heart, this is why we're here. Uh, I do believe this. If, if you look at it this way, a missionary is in a church for 30, 40, 50 minutes, an hour, hour and a half. It's of a generous church, you know. And, and we leave, and we want you to pray for us and support us for the next four, five, six years before we see each other again. And we're supposed to pray for you all and stand by you for the next four, five, six years if the Lord would have it. And it's all based off 40 minutes. It's all based off a five-minute video or based off a one-hour presentation. Well, sometimes that's pretty rough, and you almost feel like you've got to jump through a hoop, you know, and put it on flames and everything right. to create some kind of a memory in people's hearts and minds so they won't forget. Uh, so we, we can't do that, but I do believe that the Bible says my eye has affected my heart. Well, I can't take you to Rube. I can't take you to Mexico, but I can do the next best thing. My dad used to always say a picture's worth a thousand words. And so uh, let me just talk a little about who we are, where we come from, you know, what we do, try to give you a little bit of our passion. I just had a guy a few days ago, and he said, I've never been through such a long presentation. And I, I thought he was complaining at first, but then he said, no, that's okay. He said, you kind of preached through it. He says, and, and that's different. He said, I appreciate it. And he said, I can see what you believe through your presentation. I said, well, actually, that's what we try to do, and I'm glad to hear that. Uh, so today, if there is any questions at all, even if we don't get to them throughout the service, I'm completely open. Uh, I got the GPS, know how to get back to the house. I'll stay out here in the parking lot as long as I have to answer questions. And uh, one of the things that we promote uh, is visits also. You know, I don't know why, but lately we didn't have many people wanting to go to Mexico. Never figured that one out towards the end. Uh, but we got a lot more people excited about going to Aruba. And uh, so if you're one of those guys that's interested in coming to visit us, we would love to have you. I mean, we're still trying to get the Stallmans over there. Maybe we can get Pastor to get excited about coming to visit us, you know. Um, it, it, there is a lot of need. There's a lot that we can talk about. Before we get into that, uh, let me go ahead, and I'm just going to turn. Y'all can still hear me fine, right? And so we're going to go ahead and just um, jump into some of the information. We are sent out of First Baptist Church of Wayland, Missouri, uh, up in the northeast corner. Pastor Dan Diedrich and Pastor Dan Fox are our two pastors. And uh, they're right up, if you're familiar with Quincy area or Keokuk or Cahoka, right there in that corner of Missouri. My father-in-law has been pastoring there for, I think, 37, 38 years, something like that. But they've been our sending church for 20 years now. Uh, we do not have a mission board. Some people, you know, uh, not just as rebels because of that. We have two reasons we don't have a mission board. One is, uh, I believe, the closest biblical pattern that you can get to is through the local church, and we try to keep it that way. Uh, and secondly is we just simply don't need it. You know, it's an extra step that we don't need. Uh, the church covers all of the needs that we would have as far as handling our finances, doing our taxes. Uh, every time I have a question or a need, we go right back through our sending church. And uh, that is something that we're thankful for because not many churches really want to do that. And so we're grateful for a church that does. Uh, they're going through a change. My father-in-law might be stepping down here pretty soon. The assistant would become the lead pastor. And, uh, but even with that, there's unity and there's vision. And we seem to really have a joint heart with them. And so we appreciate our sending church. And again, uh, everything that we do goes through our church. Now, uh, our ministry really starts from further back in the country of Mexico, and we're in Aruba, we'll get to that in a second, I want to flash this really quick, but just kind of give you an idea of where, where we're coming from, uh, in Saltillo, Coahuila, uh, actually a town called San Antonio de las Alasanas, Coahuila, Mexico, that's a town my grandparents went back to in the 1960s, uh, 1966 to be exact, my grandfather was a Southern Baptist preacher, long story short, went to Mexico, saw the need, came back, resigned, the Southern Baptists wouldn't send him because they said, you don't place yourself. He tried to go with the independents. They wouldn't touch him because he'd been with the Southern Baptists. And so he ended up going down with the support of one little missionary Baptist church for $13 a month. And my great-grandma supported him at $10 a month. So they just load up their station wagon and $23 a month on faith. They just moved down to the field. My grandfather was a World War II vet, Army. Um, one of those guys that uh, really just... You know, if you asked him for his shoes, he'd give you shoes, literally, off his feet. And he lived very, very humbly. Uh, my mom was there from nine years old until 17. At 17, she came back to the States, went to study at Florida. By many unique circumstances, met my dad, a Navy guy from Florida, just gotten saved, surrendered to preach. Uh, they met, got married six months later, and then he went to Mexico to see the need. He saw the need, said, hey, my father-in-law needs help came back to the States, graduated from Florida at Clearwater Christian, then went down to uh, Rio Grande Bible Institute, and he was there for two years of language school. My mom already had Spanish. 
And then they moved in when my older brother was uh, two years old. My older sister was five months, uh, five weeks old. And then I came along two years later. My younger brother came along two years later. And uh, they've been there 44 years. And so uh, my dad's ministry kind of goes way back to my grandfather also. The region that they serve in is high up in the mountains. Many people don't think of mountains when they think of Mexico. But we're up in an area that's very similar to Colorado, about 15,000 foot high in the mountains. No mosquitoes, no cockroaches, apple orchards. You know, it's a beautiful area. And that's where I was raised. And we went back as a married couple after Ambassador Baptist College in 2003. So we worked with my dad's ministry from 2003 to 2006, and what we did is we pastored one of the churches my dad had started, uh, and we taught at the Bible Institute, the Christian school, and kind of got Naomi a chance to kind of get immersed in the Spanish and learn a little bit of the language, and then as soon as those three years passed, we headed further into the country to the state of Zacatecas, to the city of Guadalupe, right next to the capital, Zacatecas. Many people, Aguascalientes is right next to us. They call it the belly button of the republic. And so it's right there in the center of the country. And uh, we were privileged to work there for 10 years. The Lord allowed us to open up three different churches. And we allowed, uh, the Lord allowed us to see three other guys within our church open up three ministries. And uh, we helped them as pastor, you know, sending them out and helping them get started. So we saw six churches planted in Mexico throughout this time just to kind of fly through them. Uh, Victory Baptist Church, Iglesia Bautista Victoria, was started in 2006. And uh, the Lord brought in a young man that worked with us, and we ordained him to the ministry in 2011 and 2015. He became the pastor. I'll show you in a second. Uh, pastor, the electric story I was telling you about, that's the top corner up there. That's the light I was covering up uh, when all that happened. That's, you'll have to ask me later about that. We don't have time to get into it. But uh, that's a church building. And then the church people, of course, we had, I think it was 36 members signed the Constitution uh, and stayed behind as saved, baptized, and older than 18 members. But we had a congregation of about 60, 70 people. Brother Alan came along, graduated from my dad's Bible Institute, and married a local girl that had studied through the Bible Institute. And they're still there working. I just preached their revival three weeks ago. And uh, they have a group of about 80, 90 people working. They're continuing on. Uh, the next church we started, and we used that first church as a church, kind of like a, like, a, like a springing point in kind of our home church. And we started our second ministry in a town called Luis Moya, a town of about 12,000 people. God is Love Baptist Church. We were there uh, from 2007 to 2013. In 2013, we let a Poplo Bluff guy take over, and he married our adopted daughter and uh, took over, and he's still there working to this day. Uh, pray for him. Uh, Ryan Goodall, I don't know if any of y'all know him up around here, but uh, Ryan's still working there. He's from Victory Baptist Temple, right? And um, uh, they're uh, Piedmont, yes. And uh, he's, he's over there, got two kids now, and they're doing wonderful. The church is doing great. Just preached for them three weeks ago, too. Uh, but him and Claudia are still faithful. And then there's a third church plant we started, and this was kind of different. At this point, we had four churches that I was pastoring, or two churches and two missions. And this third one we started in 2010, a town of 40,000 people by the name of Ojo Caliente. Uh, honestly, I was over my head. We had way more to do than we possibly could. And the Lord brought into the church a young, well, not a uh, younger man, uh, the guy with the paper in the middle holding the small constitution. And what it is is he had been discouraged in ministry. He had walked away from pastoring because of different situations. And he joined our church as a member at the main first church. And so what we kind of saw the Lord do was bring in a discouraged pastor. And we started a mission that we really couldn't handle. And the Lord kind of allowed us to pass that on. And so I only pastored there for about a year and a half. Uh, and then we let him take it. And uh, Berea Baptist Church is doing great. There was only a handful of people that were saved, baptized, and uh, you know, older than 18, willing to sign onto the temporary constitution. And they're continued on. They still don't have property, don't have a building, uh, but there's a group of about 45 people in that town that are still being faithful. Uh, from there, you know, the Lord has moved us to Aruba. Now there's much more to talk about Mexico. In fact, um, Mexico's got, it's one of the countries in the world that's got the most missionaries. But then you consider it is number 10 on the population chart. Uh, there are dialects, there are groups in Mexico that to this day have not been reached. There are whole regions. I can take you to the state of Zacatecas. Uh, Brother Matt's been on those roads with me. There's certain places where you can stop and you can look off in the state of Aguascalientes and you can look off in the state of San Luis and the state of Zacatecas and, and you can see, I mean, I've done it before, 60, 70, 80 towns, you know, spots of lights at night. And in those whole valleys, I can mention one missionary, one missionary, two missionaries in the whole region. Nobody else is out there. And we could have stayed there the rest of our life. But 2009, we started looking into countries without missionaries. And again, I wish we could get into all the story, but the Lord led us to a study that uh, Brother Gil Anger had done, Brother Matt Stallman had helped with, and uh, through other material. And we started looking at the fact, hey, there's countries where there's nobody. 
And how can it be right that there are so many people working here? And the gospel's been in our country for over 200 years, speaking of Mexico. And so every camp, every church, every conference I got a chance to, including our churches, you know, I was constantly hitting the point, hey, there's countries out there with nobody. And so it kind of became almost like a hobby horse for me. Every chance I got, I'd talk about countries with nobody. And it kind of got to the point around 2012, 2013, the Lord started burning my heart and saying, hey, put up or shut up. You know, you've been talking about this for a while, and I thought, well, you know, it's not going to be for me. I'm already a missionary. I'm already out here. But it got to the point to where I didn't see anybody from our fellowship and our circle of churches getting up and saying, I'll go. I do have a brother-in-law. Naomi's got five brothers from Missouri. Uh, the youngest one has become a missionary to Solomon Islands. From what we know, he's the only guy working in the Solomon Islands. He's been locked out for two years, by the way. July, they're supposed to open up for the first time after COVID. Um, another add-on to that so y'all can pray for him. Uh, there was, China was taking over the islands a few months ago and there was revolts, riots all over the island and they started burning out the Chinese shops. Well, one of the shops they burnt had his house storage stuff and the church in the second floor. So they ended up losing everything they had, their house, all the church stuff. They got a copier, a guitar, and a projector out. That's all that got rescued. And uh, so they're going back here in July and getting a container, getting everything ready. And, and there's another guy wanting to go work with them. He's on deputation trail. If you're ever interested, they're both really good guys. But stuff like that, you know, and we saw him go and surrender. But other than that, everywhere I preached, I never saw anybody go. And I said, you know what? We got assistants that are ready to take the lead. We got people that are ready to go. If it means me going, let's go. And I got to say, I really never felt like a missionary until I left Mexico because Mexico was my country. It is my comfort zone. Spanish is my comfort language. Uh, and so when we left, I felt for the first time like I stepped out of my comfort zone. Uh, for Naomi, I mean, she's already left her country and gone to another, and then she's gone to another. My kids were all uh, born, exception of Caleb, that he went to Mexico and was three months old, but the rest of them were all born in Mexico, the dual citizens, and uh, that was their home. And so for them, this was a huge step. But basically, 2015, when we signed the church in Zacatecas, walked away from our, our last pastorate there, and in January 6th of 2016, we moved over to Aruba for the first time. Now, a few facts, information, you know, info about Aruba. Uh, many of you, if you say, if I say Aruba, what do you think? Beach, okay. Some say Elvis Presley, you know, the old Elvis song. Uh, sun, you know, palm trees, you know, coconuts and mangoes. Uh, you know, we think Caribbean. We think Hawaii. Well, that's, you're going to see some pictures here in a little bit. That's definitely not what Aruba is. Aruba is a desert island. Uh, Aruba is a dry place. We get about 18 inches of rain a year. Uh, and Aruba's got a lot of things that when I started studying different countries, because I looked into a lot of them, Aruba really started standing out. One of the reasons is because Aruba's got 110 nationalities, 110 plus nationalities in it. Uh, it speaks over 40 languages. The average citizen speaks four languages, which is Dutch, Papiamento, uh, Spanish, and English. Um, it is 19 miles or 16 miles from, uh, from Venezuela. And uh, Venezuela is a country I can't get into as a missionary with an American passport. No American can, unless you go in illegal. And so reaching Venezolanos is a point that right now has become a, a high need because so many pastors and missionaries have had to leave. We're close to Colombia, which for many years was a war-torn country because of the guerrilla warfare. And uh, there's many of the Colombians and the Venezolanos that have come over to Aruba over the years. And there's a lot of impact. And our church is mostly made up of those two nationalities, although we have 14 nationalities in the church. But Aruba... Uh, I really struck a chord in our heart, and then the Lord opened up a door in 2015 to visit. That's when we confirmed that the Lord wanted us there, resigned, and went on over. Now, Aruba is part of what we call the ABC Islands. You can't see them right there with the names, but you got Aruba, you got Bonaire, and Curaçao. The ABC Islands were part of the Dutch Kingdom. Uh, we, we are under the King of Holland. Uh, a fun fact, Holland's never had a king until right now. It's always been queens. This is the only king they've ever had, and he's got three daughters, so I guess it'll go back to being a queen here pretty soon. But anyway, uh, Holland has uh, got five uh, countries within its kingdom of the Netherlands. You've got Holland, St. Martin. You've got Aruba, Bonaire, and Curaçao. And so we wore status apart, and this last year during COVID, basically they sold themselves back to the country of Holland as a territory again. Uh, we are, like I said, uh, 16, 17 miles from Venezuela on a clear day, you can see it. As far as the island itself, it's really only six miles wide by 19 miles long. And so I don't know what miles mean to you if you're good on your measurements, but that's not very big. So we've got 19 by 6 miles. That's what's there. Uh, we have eight districts that the islands divide up into. Uh, this right here is where we live, right where the star is. And don't, don't lose that this thing isn't going to show up right here. But on the bottom, you see where it says San Nicolas or St. Nicholas. Uh, we're going to mention that here in a little bit because there's a church down there. There's a building down there that I want to mention to you at the end of the presentation. Uh, but within the island of Aruba, we have 120,000, if you Google it, pretty much legal people 
plus illegals, which could be anywhere from 15 to 20, 25,000 illegals in mostly Venezuela, Colombia, Peru, Ecuador, and uh, most of the Latin countries. Uh, a lot of Chinese, Korean, and so forth. Uh, but most of the illegals are from South America. Uh, it is very densely populated, again, because you've got a few miles. We actually got more cars on the island than people right now. It's, that's incredible, too. Uh, but if you notice, uh, starting to see with the pictures, you've got a lot of cactus, uh, a very dry, arid area. Four languages are spoken, like I said, Dutch, because we're part of the Dutch kingdom. Papiamento is what I call, it's like Tex-Mex on steroids, because it's a mix of Spanish, English, French, Portuguese, and Dutch. And, uh, and then, for example, all of our grocery stores are owned by Chinese, and they speak Mandarin or Cantonese, and so you walk into a Chinese store, and they're going to be adding Cantonese into it. And then you go to the Hindi stores that handle all the furniture and carpet and hardware stuff, and they're going to add Hindi dialect into it. And so it's kind of a catch-all. It is an official language since 1986. Uh, they taught in the schools and everything, and they call it their language, no longer dialect. But really, it just depends on who you talk to. Everybody that you talk to speaks a little bit different. And so, but it's a dialect made language. And of course, the English because of tourism and the Spanish because of the immigration. A lot of motels and restaurants are worked by the Latins. Um, we are in the middle of a beautiful ocean. I mean, we are one of the top spots of the world for snorkeling and scuba diving. There's no denying that. I mean, people say, oh, I know why you're in Aruba. Well, I wish we had time to swim. I mean, last time I went to the beach before this trip was probably two months before we left. I mean, we don't get there much, although we are five minutes from beautiful water. But really, it's just a piece of Arizona in the middle of the ocean. I mean, it's, it's, it's rock, volcanic type rock, a lot of sand. And even the sand we have is all uh, ocean sand. For example, they even import in the sand to build the blocks or to build concrete. Because even our sand is not any good and our rocks aren't any good to be able to build with. Uh, but w the big thing that makes Aruba famous within tourism is that we are out of the Hurricane Alley. Uh, since 1499, when Aruba was established by the Spaniards, we have never had a registered hurricane attack or hit on Aruba. There's never been a shark attack registered in Aruba either, for another fun fact. But, um, it's uh, an area that is out of the hurricane alley. The hurricanes come and they pass right above us. We get the tailwind sometimes, some rain here and there, but it's never really been inundated by the hurricane weather. Uh, St. Martin, for example, in 2019 got hit by a hurricane. Everything but two buildings were destroyed, and they're still rebuilding. And so that's made a lot of the cruise ships and a lot of the, uh, the tourism swing to Aruba because it's 82 degrees every day, year-round, and if you want sun, that's the place to go. And it's become a high spot. Uh, in fact, if you look at airports, there's all kinds of lines like JetBlue getting direct lines to Aruba now. And uh, there is a, about 3 million tourists coming every year. On any average day, out of four people walking the island, three of them are tourists. And that brings to the 110 nationalities that live on the island, you know, all of that variety too. Just to give you an idea, in December, we had 432 cruise ships dock in Aruba just in the month of December. Each cruise ship is usually anywhere between 13 to 17 stories tall, and they have anywhere from 3,000 to 8,000 people per ship. And so just the tourism side of it, is, it it's, it's impressive. It's amazing. Uh, again, we don't get much water. It's really dry. There is no fresh water on the island. There is no rivers, no lakes. You can't drill wells. Uh, everything that we drink from comes from a distillation plant, which means they take the salt and the minerals out of it. it tastes really good, but it's expensive. Uh, and it's really not healthy for you because there aren't any minerals left. Uh, we pay about $300, $280 a month average in our water bill, just to give you an idea. Uh, on electricity, we pay about $450 to $600 depending on the month in electricity. Uh, us and then the church pays that much too. And so uh, everything that is produced there locally is through different uh, factories, companies, machines, and so forth. It's expensive or it's imported in. Um, the coin is the florin. We got coins in the back, everything except the 200. I've only seen one 200 since they came out, uh, so they're not very common. But you see the uh, bills in the back. If you're interested, just look at them. Don't take them, okay? Uh, the little coins are the prayer reminders, not the big bills. <laughs> Unless you're going to fast for us. If you'll fast for us too, I'll let you have a bill. Uh, but anyway, uh, the coin, you got the square coin up there. You can see it. And we're talking about 1.75 florins per dollar. That has been consistent for years and years. And so the economy is really solid. There's really not much of a change in that. And um, it is all based off the tourism. That's where the strength is. Mostly a flat island. We got a few mountains here and there. Uh, as far as, you know, animals and wildlife, I always get this question, so I've added some of these pictures. We do have a native owl. We have a native rattlesnake. We have all kinds of colors and sizes of lizards. You know, we got wild goats that roam the island that you're not supposed to eat or touch. They're kind of not sacred, but they're protected by the wildlife environment people. And then we have a bunch of iguanas that they used to eat. Now they're protected by the government. You know, we got uh, scorpions and um, about 14-inch um, centipedes, about 14-inch long, 2 inches wide, nice and thick and juicy. 
Uh, those are native to the area. We've killed, and, and we got, I don't know why, but there's a bunch of uh, boas on the island. Somebody let them go, like in Florida, and uh, we've, we've killed, I think, 17 boas right around our house, and we've killed probably 15 or 16 uh, centipedes and a, a couple scorpions inside the house and everything. So but those are native, but again, it's a desert island. That's what's there. Now, we have some cockroaches and stuff, but not much in the way of mosquitoes because of the dryness. It is closer to the equator, sunburns a lot but you don't have the high humidity that you have in a lot of the islands. And so you, you pay in one way, but you get in another. So a lot of the saguaro cactus and our trees that grow on the island are what they call the DV trees, DV, DV trees. It's like a mesquite tree. And if you see any of the calendars or pictures of the room, you're always going to have all the plants growing to one side. That's because our breeze runs 24-7 all year long in the same direction. So it makes everything that grows grow with a slant to one side. So I don't know if any of you guys fishermen like fishing. Okay, I, 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 I like fishing. Of course, in Mexico, there's not a lot of fishing to do. But when I got to Aruba, I don't usually get to say this, but y'all guys aren't falling asleep on me, so I'm going to go. Uh, <laughs> balloon fishing. You ever heard of balloon fishing? You know, I got there, and they said, hey, let's go balloon fishing. And I said, balloon fishing? Now you balloon fish? You know, what we're getting? what are we getting? And what it is is you take, you go to the north side, and you can't fish because it's solid rock and solid uh, uh, cliffs and the wind's coming at you so you can't cast out far enough. So you go to the south side where all the tourists are. You can't fish in the daytime because you'll catch a tourist. Uh, but at nighttime you go out there and you put your hook out on a reel, not a, not a, not a metal reel but just a plastic reel uh, with as much string as you can get. And you blow up your balloon. Right before you're going to tie it, uh, you stick in a loop of that string. And you just cast that balloon out and the wind will carry it. And so the wind will take it and take it and take it and use a flashlight. And when you can just barely see a dot out there on the horizon, you pull on that line, it comes out of the balloon, the balloon flies off, and the hook falls. And that's the only way you can get out deep enough and far enough so you can fish. And so you tie off six, seven, eight lines until you catch something. And I've seen some huge suckers come in with balloon fishing. And so if you ever come to Aruba, we'll go night balloon fishing, you know. So anyway, I'm trying to encourage you all guys to come visit, okay. So, uh, again, the water is beautiful. There's no denying it. And the tourism is there. Uh, I've never been to a place where they drink as much as Aruba. And I've never been to a place where there's as many parties. Between the casinos, between the bars, the discos, uh, it is everywhere. One of the things that we've been, we're still uncomfortable around it. But, you know, we were in Mexico up in the mountains. We never saw a bikini. And then you move to Aruba where people are going to a grocery store. They're going to the gasoline station. And that's all around. And that's something that as Christians we struggle with. But it's what's there, and that's a reality. Um, now, uh, rent, just to kind of give you an idea here, you, this is a travel container, 20 foot off the back of a trailer. Uh, they take these things, put doors and windows in them, and these go for about $450, $500. That's where your rent starts. And so you can imagine in the heat how hot these can get. So from there on up, the rent goes up. You imagine a house, three, four bedrooms, three, four bathrooms, you know, it gets up into several thousand dollars if you're not careful. Like I said, all the grocery stores owned by the Chinese, they have uh, a huge corner on all the market. We do have a small aloe vera farm that uh, grows aloe vera. They make soap, shampoos, and creams out of it. But that is really the only industry on the island that hires about 38 people. Um, 81% Catholic, more than 250 charismatic churches. There's 352 churches registered on the island. There's a Southern Baptist church, and there's R2 churches, which is an English church and a Spanish church. That's what there is. Uh, there's a mosque. There's a synagogue. There is every flavor of charismatic you can imagine. We started with this group of people in June of 2015. Uh, started getting together under the roof of one of our men. It's from Spain, a Spaniard. He loaned us his patio. Uh, very hot and difficult for the first year, but this is where the Lord allowed us for this first time. Uh, from there, we went to a building that uh, a lawyer rented us. Had about 120 people coming together in this place. Uh, we were there for about a year and a half, two years. And then from there, the Lord took us to our, was our biggest building so far, and it was downtown, wonderful location, wonderful building, about three blocks away from where the boat stock. We had uh, access to the tourism, access to the bus, to the taxis. We were right downtown, but we were paying about $2,600 a month in rent. And so every month, we were in the red, in the red, in the red. We used it for two years, and it was a blessing. It was here that we signed the Constitution. Uh, back in 2018, it's when we made the church covenant. Uh, everybody up there in the pictures, the ones that are saved, baptized, and older than 18 that signed the church covenant. Uh, but from there, basically, the Lord led us on to the house that we're in today. And what it is is we found a house to where we could fit as a family, and it had a patio in the back. And I'll try to give you an idea of the patio here with this shot. Uh, in meters, it's uh, about 15, 13 by, uh, by about 25 meters. And it, within that space, it had a concrete slab, and the owner said, we'll let you build anything you want to as long as it's not out of concrete or you don't mess with that foundation. 
So what we did is we put together what we are calling a floating building. Basically, we threw pallets on the ground, covered them with plywood, used two by fours, put up an American style building on top of the pallets. Uh, inside, we covered it with drywall, and the outside, we covered it with concrete board. Painted it, put everything together with screws, got a 10 roof, and it was about $32,000 investment. But the idea is that whenever we leave this place, we'll be able to take everything apart. The drywall will go to waste, but other than that, we can use everything that we invested and reinvest it in a permanent building, hopefully. So now for the first time in seven years, as of last year, we're actually saving money in the bank every year instead of in the red every month. And that's, that's and so we live at the house and the church is right behind us. Uh, we got the English service at 8.30 Sunday mornings and Thursdays. Spanish is at 10.30 and Wednesdays. And then I'll get to Sunday night here in a little bit with another church we want to start. So we share the same building. They share the same pastor, but it's two different congregations coming together. We work with about 150 people, about 110 uh, people in the Spanish group, and about 40, 38 people in the English group. And uh, that gonna, goes up and down. We got a lot of changes, a lot of people that have had to immigrate, uh, that have had to leave. Uh, especially during COVID, uh, 40,000 people lost their jobs in two weeks when COVID hit, and a lot of those people just left. They said, if there's no more work, we can't be here. And so uh, these are our last four anniversaries. Our sixth one was just this past July. And um, again, we've got a lot of good people that we've lost, and uh, it's been rough. The good thing about that is we got guys preaching in Venezuela today that actually started with us. And we got people that are in Colombia and people that are in Peru and Ecuador that were with us for a while. And many of them are in places where there's no pastors. And so they're listening to our recordings. If you're familiar with WhatsApp, uh, we do all of our recordings on Facebook Live and WhatsApp. And then we send them. And we got quite a few people that are listening to our messages through recordings. And that's how they're feeding themselves. Um, People ask us quite often, you know, as missionaries, what do you do? You know, there is all kinds of missions out there. But as church plan and missionaries, you know, it all starts and all goes back with preaching the word, preaching the gospel, you know. And that can have so many different faces, so many different ways, although really it's the same thing, telling people about Christ and uh, seeing people get saved and then seeing people come to church and become true disciples and becoming faithful to the things of God. Uh, you know, uh, one of the first things we try to see when we see people saved, and we're not a ministry that's raise your hand for a balloon, raise it for a hot dog, raise it for Jesus, boom, you're saved. We got another number on our list. You know, we don't, and if you read our emails and stuff, you're going to see that. We're not in big numbers, but we want to see true, genuine growth within people. We want to see people coming to church. We want to see people getting baptized. We want to see families restored. We want to see a church that's going to come together. It's going to be local. It's going to be autonomous, and it's going to last for the years, and it's going to grow, and that's what I believe where True Missions is. Uh, but anyway, the Lord has blessed us. As you see, we suffer because we don't have a baptistry. We have to go to the ocean, and uh, this is rough, you know. Uh, this one was right before we came, the Sunday right before the strip. Um, just to kind of give you an idea, the guy on the left is from Suriname, raised in Aruba. The guy next to me, the bald guy, Fabio, he's from Colombia, and his wife, Margi, is from Peru. I mean, that's the way our church is. You know, we got people from all over the place. Uh, we did almost lose one guy. This guy in the middle, I almost lost him with a wave. Uh, you can't see it there, but he's about a foot taller than I am. Uh, but there's some big guys over there. But anyway, uh, we do a lot of discipleships. This is one of the families we've been discipling recently. She's from Brazil. He's from Suriname, like I said. Uh, and we do discipleships once a week. We have a 15-week course that we've put together. It starts with what is the Bible, and it ends with eschatology. And so it goes from one point to the other. We don't get into salvation until chapter 6. So many of the discipleship courses I've seen start with baptism, and they jump salvation. So we get into what's the Bible, then uh, who is God, and we get into the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, and then we get into uh, what is sin, what is man. And then finally around chapter 6, we get into uh, what is salvation. And from there we continue on. Um, we take the discipleship seriously. That's where most of our growth, I believe, honestly is. As far as activities, guys, and I'll just kind of flash through these, we use about anything we can. You know, anything at all that we can use to be able to draw people in. I don't mean that in a way of buying people, but in the sense of having activities, whether it be day of the child, day of the father, day of the mother, Mother's Day, Father's Day, Grandfather's Day, you know, uh, anything we can do uh, to be able to have an activity and to be able to preach to people, uh, you know, and if it works, sometimes, like, I was in Mexico for a long time, VBSs didn't work. It got to the point where nobody would come to VBSs and nobody ever get saved. We've done BBSs in Aruba and we had 14 kids saved this last year. And so it's just one of those things to where we continue to try. There's all kinds of groups and niches of ministry. Uh, I say it this way, Pastor. I believe our churches are supposed to be leaning our fingerprints over our societies. And the sad truth is we're not touching our societies much anymore. You do the history study on it and you're going to find that most hospitals, most food shelters, most rehab centers, most jail ministries, most uh, rescue centers of any kind, whether prostitution, drugs, alcohol, almost every one of these ministries started among Christians and mostly among Baptists. I mean, but where are Christians in any of these groups now? I mean, how many Christians are you know, involved in a Red Cross? And we say, oh, Red Cross is completely worldly now. Well, it is because Christians have quit doing it, and we've given it away. 
And the honest truth is we don't touch. I mean, proof's in the pudding. You know, we have a hurricane come through, and the Jehovah Witness and Mormons will send people to help. And a few Southern Baptists will go and help. And one out of a thousand independent Baptist churches will send somebody to help. But the rest of us don't. And we seem to think that we need to preach the gospel, but we never touch, we never impact. I'll give you an example. For example, I was, uh, we got a radio ministry, and uh, I was sitting there waiting for my time to go in, and a commercial came in, and they announced a beach cleanup uh, from, a, from a disco. And a disco and a bar was putting together a chance to go clean up a mile of beach. And it's just to clean up a mile of beach. But it hit me. I said, why in the world is a disco cleaning the beach? And I have never heard of a church going to clean up a beach or going to clean up a square or do something in the community. And right then and there, I told the church, I said, you know what? We're putting together a beach clean. And we had 64 people come out. And we cleaned a mile and a half of beach, filled a huge container. And you might say, what does that do for the good of eternity? Well, we want to touch our society. And we want to know we're here. We care, and we're going to do everything we can to try to impact. And so we're trying to do that within the old, within the young, and so many different ways that we can. Uh, we have tried a couple of things that have not worked, and uh, others that have been amazing uh, success. And so we're just going to kind of continue trying to discover anything we can to reach. Uh, now, Aruba's got some varieties and some differences. For example, your Dutch people are very punctual, their own time, but they're short-winded. You're supposed to end when you're supposed to end. Y'all can relate, right? And, uh, and, you know, you come for what you come, and let's get out of here. You know, where the Latins, it's, hey, let's hang around. As long as I don't got to be nowhere, hey, does anybody got food? Uh, you know, I remember the first fellowship time. We were sitting at a table, and one of our Dutch ladies said, hey, can you pass me a piece of bread? And so six Latin people grabbed a piece of bread and passed it from hand to hand. Well, when it came to the Dutch lady, she went, ah, you touched my bread. <laughs> and so, I mean, even before COVID hit, they were wanting to wear a mask and Pinterest and stuff and everything uh, because they're very careful and they're very clean in that sense. So the Latins, you know, we all, 10 of us, drink out of the same bottle, you know, really don't care. I never really thought about stuff like that until you put them all in the same room. And you try to work with everybody and put them on the same schedule, and you got Dutch people showing up one time and saying, we were supposed to be done five minutes ago, and the Latins are just showing up. And so that's one of the reasons for the change in the English and the Spanish, that we got two different groups going. Uh, but anyway, we try to use everything we can, and some of the things haven't worked, and it's been kind of a work in progress. Uh, but the Lord has been good, and we've been able to continue on all the work we've done. We've done ourselves. We don't believe in hiring it out unless we just simply can't do it. But the only thing we can't do personally is air conditioner. And again, I'm not very digital. But other than that, we do all the construction and work ourselves. Did a lot of food. And so let me finish with these last two things, because I want to... I don't want to abuse of your time and attention, but there's two things that I specifically want you to pray for us if you can please think about it. One is our radio ministry. Our radio ministry, if you'd have asked me two years ago, would you even be interested in radio? I would have said you're crazy. It's a lot of money. It's a lot of time, and it doesn't work. But someone offered us an hour of radio really cheap, two, three minutes from my house, and so we jumped on it from 12 to 1, five days a week. Uh, then we increased it another hour, so we're 11 to 1, five days a week. So we got 10 hours. Uh, spent about five, $600 to do it. And I have been shocked. We have people listening local. We have three families right now in church that have come in this last year through the radio ministry. Uh, we've walked into grocery stores, uh, hardware places, and heard the radio gone, which means that an hour before I was there, they were listening to our program, and it's on the loudspeakers. Uh, we got people in 16 countries right now we know of listening to the radio broadcast. And uh, we do a lot of preaching. We do a lot of doctrine. We do a lot of uh, you know, nuggets of gold, just tidbits and stuff. But we put music. Most of it's teaching and preaching. And we're being listened to live, and then we're taping it. And again, with WhatsApp, we're sending it out on a chat for anybody who wants to listen later on in the day and not live. It has been amazing. I was telling Brother Stallman, we got people in about a dozen countries right now that have said, we're listening to your recordings for a church service because we don't have a church. We don't have a pastor. Could, is there any way you could help us start a church? And it's like, this one you wish you could cut an arm off and send it somewhere and cut a foot off and send it somewhere else, you know. But we can't be everywhere. But the need is there and people are listening. We got people from other countries that we can never get to. Again, Venezuela. I can't go even if I wanted to. I want to, but I can't go. But, you know, we got people in Venezuela listening live and listening to recordings. And then, like, we got one lady. She gets the recording and she passes it on to her family chat that's got 60 people on it. People I'll never meet. But they're hearing two-hour recordings twice, I mean, five times a week. So they're listening to 10 hours of recording every week. And so the radio ministry has been interesting. Please pray for this. When we came on this trip, we had to close it. We really didn't have anybody that could cover it, and we weren't sure the church was going to be able to swing the finances with us not being there. So we closed it down, and when we get back in July, we're hoping to be able to find those hours available. And I hope they won't give us like 2, 3 o'clock in the morning, a.m. hours, and we can find a good schedule and kind of get back to it. Uh, and that the Lord will allow us. We're trying to find out a way to disciple people through the Internet and to truly follow up on them through the means that we have. And that's not very easy. Uh, but that's there. And the other thing I want to ask you to pray about is 
On the far side of the island, down on the south side, there is the first Baptist building that was built. The first Baptist church was started by an American missionary by the name of Hosteller. He came in the 80s. He started this church, named it Bible Way Baptist Church. He was there for about 12, 15 years, did a wonderful work, ended up having like 150 people. And throughout this time, you know, he, he was great. But then his son went off to college. His wife went with the son, and she said, you follow me or you stay. So he said, okay, I'll go with you. So he left the church, left it in the hands of a young man that uh, had just recently gotten married, Long story short, this guy falls in sin. The church splits four different times. The church has been closed for over 10 years now. And so the building is there. The guy that fell in sin is still there. He opens it up once in a while. And as you can see at this point, it's, they, they just recently cut all the grass back. Uh, but at this point, the grass is this high right now. And it's just abandoned. Uh, it's got termites coming into the wood. All the air conditioners are ruined. The fans are all folding down and so forth. And he came to us six years ago when we first got there. And he says, can you please come and start the church up again? He said, you'll be the pastor because I can't pastor anymore, and I'll sit on the front bench and tell you what you need to do. And I said, you know, I can't work that way. That's, when, that's not going to flow. I said, if you want to give me the building and walk away, you know, we'll start something. And he said, no. Well, three months before this trip, back in November, he came to me and he said, okay, enough's enough. You're the only guy that can take this. This has to go back to Baptist hands because, you know, it was built by Baptist, and, and it needs to go back to Baptist church. So whatever you need to do, do it. I'll walk away. So pray with us. Two things. One is this is going to be our third church plant. We're looking at Sunday nights, p.m., and Tuesdays. So it would be Sunday nights and Tuesdays at this church, whether it be English or Spanish or whatever. Sunday mornings, 8.30, and Thursdays, English. Sunday mornings, 10.30, and Wednesdays, Spanish. Right now, without the third mission, I'm preaching an average of 15 times a week without discipleships and so forth. Uh, we are saturated. Honest truth, economically, time, even more than money, even more than health, time. I don't have enough time. I can't do it. One hour of radio, if I do it right, takes three hours in my office. I need help. The building's there. We've already got contacts with the radio ministry that are saying, hey, do you got anything on this end of the island that we can go to? And so there's contacts. There's a building. It looks like things are opening. We're going to tear down the sign, paint the building, put a new name up, you know, give it as fresh a face as we can. The idea is in July we get back from this trip in June. We're going to be in total of 78, 78 churches so far. Uh, by the time this trip is over, I think it's 45,000 miles that we got on the calendar we're looking at. Uh, and but as soon as we get back, we're going to launch into this church plant also. We've got three or four young people that have come to me and said, I'm interested. You know, maybe we can go visit for a couple months and see what's happening. So pray with, pray with us that the Lord will provide strength to be able to do what we need to do, finances to cover what we need to cover, but especially people. And maybe I'm talking to a young person. Maybe I'm talking to an old person. You know, my grandfather went to Mexico when he was 55. And everybody laughed at him and said, you're crazy. You're never going to learn the language and you're never going to do anything. Well, he never started a church. He never did. And he left the field feeling, feeling dejected, and he went and he died at his house. The day he died, you know, he was still kicking and screaming, saying, I never did anything. But you look down the road, and he's got seven grandkids that are full-time ministry. His son-in-law started 17 churches in a Bible institute and a Christian school, which producing pastors every year. And you look at the surrender that he had and how it has impacted a family and a society. And, you know, you might think I'm too old. You might think like we're saying, well, go, I'm little, I'm, I'm, I'm nothing. Well, we are. Congratulations when we get it figured out. You know, but when you say, I'm willing to go, I'm willing to do, you'd be surprised what the Lord can do with you. And, and there's so many places. You know, it used to be you have to learn the language. Hey, 80% of Aruba is going to understand your English. And your American passport has an open entrance. They love Americans. They will not deny an American passport. You can walk in, no questions asked, no visa for up to three months. If there's anything in you that would say, hey, I, I, I think I could do that, come on. One of these buildings that's in the back, you can see in the far left corner, there's three Sunday school rooms. We can adapt one into an apartment in a jiffy. No rent. Literally, literally two minutes from the ocean. Get up and go take a swim every morning if you want. I don't want to buy you off, but <laughs> we need help, guys. And uh, I, I can't say it enough. Um, Amen. The world is big, and there is so much going on. Um, there is, there's passages in the Bible that are famous, passages in the Bible that, you know, we almost abuse in missions conferences. I think Matthew 9 is one of them. I want to talk to you really quick, and I'm not going to abuse you, believe me. Some of you are starting to get sleepy now. And so, uh, but I want to just look at something really quick, and I want to encourage you with this. And I hope that you can genuinely see and feel a little bit of what we believe and how we live. Now, finances, Pastor asked me early, 
uh, what's your percentage? And I said, well, brother, we don't work in percentages. I got 100% of what God wants me to have, and I use 100% of what I get. <laughs> um, right now, we have about $4,000, and I say about because we just had five churches take us on the last month, so I'm really not sure where that's going to leave us, but about $4,000 coming in a month. Uh, that's, in Mexico, we had 3000 and it gave us free money to move, to do, to travel, to build, because Mexico, the economy was a lot better. And we just went to Ruba on that, and this other 1000 the Lord's kind of raised it throughout the last six years. In churches that I've never even, we got church supporting us from Maryland. I don't, I've never even been to Maryland. You know, God has done that, and it's done it in an amazing way. But I'm really not even here tonight asking, hey, would you give me money? That's, I, I believe with all my heart, if your heart's in the right place, your wallet's going to be in the right place. If your heart's in the right place, you know your actions are going to be in the right place. I mean, we're just going to submit. That's all there is to it. And when it comes down to missions, you know, we know it needs to be done. We know that we need to reach out. We know that there's more to accomplish. We know, and, and we support, and we've been, I, I, told, I told Brother Matt this, and, you know, don't take this wrong, guys, but, you know, I said this in the church the other day, and I, nobody stoned me, but a couple people grabbed hymn books. I was kind of wondering. Uh, you know, I said, folks, if you're willing to give me $100 to go win a Venezolano for Christ, but you're not willing to reach across the aisle at Walmart and shake the hand and invite to your church the Venezolano that's come in illegal to the country, but he's right there two foot away from you, you might as well keep your money because your heart's not in the right place and your money's not going to do much good. Folks, I, I, the missions problem today has very little to do with money. Now, we need it, yeah, and it's there, and the Lord will provide it. And if he doesn't provide it, I think there's other ways to work. We're getting to a day and age where many missionaries are starting to get a, a job. And that's not all that bad. It provides contacts and opens up doors that aren't bad. And it stretches our faith and it makes us learn to depend on the Lord. That's not a bad thing. That's what we need. The problem really isn't money. The problem comes down to different aspects. And I think in this passage we see it. Matthew chapter 9, you might even know this by memory here, but I'm just going to read in verse 35. And I just want to share, uh, probably if I can sum it up, to two very simple things here that, that, I, that I think we should focus on. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. I'm not going to get into this, but I like saying it this way. Jesus never preached with his hands in his pocket. Jesus preached, and he loved people as he preached. He taught, and he showed that he loved with what he did. And we are in a day and age when most of us Christians, at best, we say we love and we throw money at it. But we don't touch many lives. The fingerprints of Jesus Christ are all over this world. The fingerprints of God and his plan and his salvation are on so many, I mean, everything, everybody around us, one way or another, whether they know it or not. But my question is, where's the fingerprints of our church? Where's our fingerprints? Are we impacting people? Are we truly, genuinely touching people and showing them we love them? Well, Jesus did. But then verse 36, when he saw the multitude, he, moved with, he was moved with compassion. I love doing a study on Jesus, on his compassion. Multiple times throughout the Bible, it says that he had compassion. You've heard messages like this. You know, and how many times he showed passion for the people, you know. In this case, because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep, having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, this summation here, that he, and he's talking, he says, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Now, who does the harvest belong to? It belongs to the Lord. He's the Lord of the harvest. Uh, one of my favorite verses is Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. It's become my life verse. I remember back in Zacatecas, the Luis, the, the carpenter, was across the street. I, 10 years. Today. In fact, I was just there three weeks ago. And I walked up to him and his two sons, Carlos and his son, Luis Jr. And I says, and I preached. And they all promised to come. Neither one of them came. And I says, Luis, how long? How long have you heard the gospel? He used to say he wouldn't come to church because he was smoking. He's quit smoking because he had a heart attack. I said, now you're not even smoking. And you still won't go to church. You know, what is going on? What's happening? You know, I used to get so frustrated. I had one lady got saved and it took her seven years to get baptized. And I would get so exasperated. Why can't you understand it? And the Lord hit me over the head one day with Philippians 1.6. And he said, hey, it's not your work. It's my work. I'm the one that started it. I'm going to perfect it complete it in every sense, and I'm going to do it in my time. Amen. And I come to realize, yes, I am a little piece of the puzzle, but I'm just a small piece that by grace is able to do something. It's in the Lord's hands, and he's going to do it, and he's going to fulfill it, and it's going to be his time. And I'm just content to be a small part of it. He's the Lord of the harvest. It's his work. He started, he'll finish, and, and he knows how he's going to do it. We just are privileged, genuinely, to be able to even observe, to be a part, to be able to put our hand to the part of the plow. But there's two passages here. When we look into missions, what's the problem? 
Uh, we see two things here that I think are two of the main problems in missions today. One is prayer. I'm going to get to the workers here in a little bit. But prayer. When God says, hey, when Jesus says there's a need for laborers. The harvest is great. The laborers are few. Pray. It's not a giving problem. And I dare say this church might be completely different. Pastor, I don't know if you even know how much this church prays. I know you just got here, Pastor. But, but folks, how much do you pray here? You know the average Baptist church prays five minutes per service, and that includes the introductory prayer, the offertory prayer, the sermon prayer, and the closing prayer? Unless you ask that one deacon to pray. Every church has got that one deacon that when he prays, he prays for the whole list, and everybody's like, why did you call on brother so-and-so to pray, <laughs> you know? But other than, unless you call, and if you're laughing, that means there's somebody here that's one of those deacons, right? And if that's you, praise the Lord and keep on praying, okay? Don't let anybody laugh you out. You keep on praying. But, you know, Amen. the average Baptist church, we don't pray. One of our least attended services or moments of any service is prayer. Yeah. In fact, when anybody's praying in the service, we use it to check our cell phone, to pick our nose, to fix our hair, to fix our belt buckle. Let's just be honest. We use it to do all kinds of stuff. In fact, I'm a little bit, and I'm not stepping on anybody's toes here, but I'm even a little bit against all the churches that they use prayer time to move choirs, to move microphones, to move. I'm thinking, hold on a second. What are we doing? We're just taking advantage because everybody's closing their eyes? And, and I'm sorry, but this has happened in a lot of church culture. You know, it's, it's, it's church culture. That's what we do. Everybody's praying, and so let's move everybody around because this is a broadcast. This is a show. We've got to have everything ready. When they open up their eyes, it's all transformed. What happened to being before the Lord? What happened to coming before a throne? You know, if you're standing before a president, eyes open or closed, you wouldn't be picking your nose in front of him. You, you, there, there would be an attitude of reverence, of respect. And we either are not realizing who it is we're praying to, or we just simply are forgetting the fact that we're supposed to be coming before his presence. Right. We're not praying enough. If we genuinely prayed, my eye has affected my, art, my heart, this, or my, my eyes have affected my heart, Scripture says, one of the things that I believe that ministries like Brother Stallman's has done and others, Brother Anger before him, and others that are doing this kind of thing, and pastors that are taking the time and showing maps and they're showing countries. I got, I got a brother-in-law. It's a pastor in Columbus, North Carolina. And he took a mission trip down to Brazil. And he took a young guy, 17-year-old guy. And he took a 17-year-old guy to go with him. And he was there at a campground. He saw the need, and he was impressed. He came back, stood before his church, and said, Folks, I want you to pray for me. I'm called to Brazil. Well, long run, he never even got to the United Church anymore. But why did he feel called to Brazil? Why not Iraq? Because that's what he saw. That's the only thing he was exposed to. So I praise the Lord for churches and men and ministries and mission trips that open up your eyes to the rest of the world and places where nobody's going and saying things that nobody else is saying. And we've got to get out of the box in so many different ways when it comes to missions. We need the information that goes behind it, but are we praying about even what we know? Because sometimes we're guilty of even just collecting information. And well, National Geographic and Discovery type guys, you know, we like learning. We like, what are we doing with it? Yeah. Do we genuinely pray for missionaries? Do we genuinely pray for the people that are out there working? Do we genuinely pray for the countries where there is no one? You know, we will weep when, I don't know if any of y'all guys are movie guys, but it, it's amazing to me, you know, you'll see the star of the movie die and you got people crying. Ladies that watch their soap operas, you know, they got the lady got left by her husband and she's weeping there throughout the soap opera. Okay, we're pretty spiritual tonight, okay. <laughs> when my 4x4 four four truck blows an engine. Ah, uh, there you go. There you go. <laughs> when I can't buy that gun or that bow and arrow or when the buck gets away. There you go. <laughs> we'll cry for some of the craziest things. We'll cry for some of the dumbest things. Our football team won't make it, or it does make it, and we'll break down in tears. And you have these big six-foot guys crying for a football team or a basketball team or a baseball team. Yep. But when's the last time we cried for anything related with missions, anything related with people? We say we love people. Yeah. Do we? Prayer, prayer is one of those things we've got to get back to in, in every aspect of church life. Amen. But when it comes down to missions, it is one of the things, and I say it again, don't ever send me a dime. I'm dead serious. If you, if you don't ever send a dime, but if you'll pray for me, we are blessed indeed. Amen. Genuinely pray. Addison, we have a guy, we were in Iowa, Kiyosakwa, Iowa, for those you know up there in Iowa. And there's a little bitty church with about 15 people, used to have an interim pastor. He's gone now. 
He emailed me. He was there for months, and he was there last time we presented our ministry seven years ago. And he wrote me just this week, and he says, Brother Matt, I'm still praying for you every day at 8 o'clock. He says, and I got your old prayer card, and I'm about worn it out, and I'm sure your kids are grown. Could you send me a new prayer card? And I told him, Brother, you don't know how good that does me, what it does to my heart to know that somebody every morning at 8 o'clock is genuinely praying. You know, where, where's prayer when it comes to missions? But there's another aspect, and it comes down to it. When it boils down to it, folks, again, it's not about the money. It's not about the logistics. It's not about, hey, there's no need. That's why I'm not moving. No, no, no. All those things are present, and they will all fall in place. Even the direction as to where we work and what we do, you know, the Lord will provide all of that. But it boils down to two main problems. We're not praying enough, and there's no labors. And they go hand in hand because we want the labors, but then we don't want to pray about it. And that's not possible, and that's why I start with prayer. But if you look at the phrase in verse 37, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. I was studying this a few months back. My kids get tired of this because they get to hear me preach, you know, three, four times a week, so poor them. But anyway, you know, it, it just it hit me, and I was thinking, what happens when you've got a lot of harvest and you've got few laborers? When you can apply this to apple picking, you can apply it to strawberry picking, you can apply it to uh, milk and cows, you can apply whatever harvest you want to look at. But when you have a lot of work to do and you have few people doing it, I find at least three things that happen. First place, when you have a lot of work to do and few to do it, first place, the few that are working get worn out. You know any tired preachers? Any worn out missionaries? <laughs> you, know, you know people that get burnt out and leave the ministry and just say, I can't do it anymore? Parts the way we work and we think we're the Lone Rangers and we don't need to work with anybody else and we've got to do it alone. And we, uh, that's not the way it's supposed to happen. Look at the scriptures, and that's not the pattern we're given. We're supposed to work together. We're supposed to have fellowship and teamwork. You know, but when you're the only guy stepping out and doing the work of 10, and it's you by yourself, you're going to get worn out. You know, you go, to, you go to insurance agencies, and they got us preachers up there with firefighters and, and daredevils and so forth. They got us at the top of the bracket. Said, I'm not crazy. I mean, I'm top of the bracket. I got to pay a high premium for life insurance. Oh, you're a preacher. Preachers die early. Preachers always have heart attacks. Preachers have a high level of stress. Why? Well, part of the reason is because you've got few people doing the work of many. So when you've got a huge harvest and few laborers, the few that are working are getting worn out. Secondly, when you have a lot to do and few to do it, what little bit does get done gets done poorly. You ever had to do the work of five or six and you're by yourself and you move here and you move here and you move here and you do this and you do that and then this got burnt and this one didn't get flipped in time and ladies in the kitchen you ever had to make breakfast for 15 or 20 and you're all by yourself and things start falling apart it's like well I can't do it all well you can't you ever seen churches that was oh pastor wasn't on, on spot today his sermon really it just didn't even connect Oh, man, the church wasn't even clean today bus route was late oh man it just there's no letters up on the mission board I don't know what, what's he doing we got him working by himself. And we got him covering everything from scrubbing toilets sometimes to doing bus routes. And I don't know if that happens in the States, but in the mission field it happens an awful lot. And you're starting up from scratch and you get stuck with everything. And it gets to the point to where, yeah, I'm working. But not much is coming out good. Because I'm trying to do this and I'm trying to do this and I'm trying to do this. And I'm getting it done. But it's not getting done near as well as it should be. So first place, those that are working get worn out. Secondly, what does get done gets done poorly in many cases. And that's really not a condemnation of those that are working. It's just the fact they're by themselves and they can't do it all. Yeah. Thirdly, what happens when you've got a huge harvest? When you have a thousand apples to pick and you only got ten people picking, what's going to happen to a lot of those apples? You're going to have some fall to the ground. You're going to have some waste. Now, I know we're talking about people, not apples. So can a person go to waste? Well, it's the Lord's harvest. He's going to take care of it. Well, yeah, he will, but who does he use? Could it be possible that there's families, souls, young people, whole societies that are going to waste because nobody's going? Amen. Now, if you go to Ezekiel and Jeremiah, it talks about the watchtower and the watchman, right? Sure. And it says they will perish in their sin. A sinner goes to hell, a sinner goes into eternity without Christ, he's going to be judged for his own sin. He's got, the way I see it in the Bible, there's five voices that tell us about God. Creation, the conscience, the conscience based off information, but a conscience tell you about God, tell you there's an existence. 
the Holy Spirit, the Word of God, and the Church of God. And a person that has never seen a Bible, a person that, according to Romans 1, he's never been preached to, he's still without excuse. Right. And he will be judged for his sin. But what happened to the watchman? In both Ezekiel and Jeremiah, there's blood on their hands. And so I'm not responsible for their sin. But there is a level of responsibility placed on me for having said what I know I was supposed to say. And this isn't a ploy, folks, to try to put you into a situation where you feel blame. But we should be shamed. And I use the word that Paul used. We should be shamed when there are parts of the world, when there are parts of our society, when there are members of our family that do not know the gospel. Now, if they know the gospel and make their own choice, that's on their head, and they know. But we should be watchmen. We should be hollering out the truth. Folks, if there was a snake in this room, I don't care how much of a man you are, you'd either be killing the snake and making a ruckus, or you'd be on a chair with the ladies. You know, but we're not going to sit quiet about it. You're going to make an issue out of it because there's a rattlesnake rolling around in the room. You know, we say that there's a hell. We say that there's an eternity. We say that we know that there's a need. What do we really do about it? The harvest is great, but the laborers are few. The few that are working are getting worn out, and they're giving up, and they're striking out time and again because they're by themselves. The few that are working, they're working. But it just seems like so many things that they're doing. You know, and, and I had myself to the top of that list. I, I walk into the radio so many times, and I'm, I'm looking in my old notebooks from college days, Matt. <laughs> So I said, oh, I need a quick message today because <laughs> I didn't have time to get ready. And I got 16 nations of people represented and all my church listening on live in 10 minutes and they're ready. And what do I do? I pull out a message from Wearsby. Okay, that's what I got. That's all I had time for. And praise the Lord for Wearsby, but hey, <laughs> that's not the way it's supposed to work. And I end up doing what I'm supposed to be doing, but I just do it not near as good as it should be done because I'm by myself. And the worst and the most convicting of all is there's people out there. There's part of the harvest that's going to waste. Amen. There's families that are falling apart, societies that are falling apart. And I'm not saying one missionary is going to change a whole society, but you look at history and you look at countries where the gospel has showed up. Yeah. And you look at the effect, the impact yeah. that the gospel has had on countries in Africa, in Europe, South America. You look at what's happening. We don't need to go even further than just simply say what's happening to the U.S. The farther we walk away from the gospel, the impact that this book and its truths have upon our society. And we can be part of that. Amen. Or we can walk away and worry more about our gun and our four-wheeler and our boat and our championship fish. And we can worry more about our retirement. And we can worry more about our house. And we can worry more about some of the dumbest things out there sometimes and let a whole world go to hell. This isn't a ploy to say, hey, guys, give me a low offering tonight. That yeah. is, I, I could care less. God will provide. He has for years, and he will continue to do so. Amen. But I can't keep on doing it alone. I need help in Aruba. But Aruba's at least got one missionary. Aruba's at least got one Baptist church. Martinique, 280,000 people, as best I can figure, doesn't have a single Baptist church. Bhutan, anybody in Bhutan, Brother Matt? Not yet. Comoro Islands? And we could go down the list. And I know you all have heard stuff like this because I know who's been here. Yeah. But, guys, somebody's got to go. Amen. Yeah. What are we doing? Oh, I've tried and tried. That's not me. Well, that means you're praying, right? That means you're praying because if we genuinely care about it and if we know we can't go, then the other problem's prayer. Let's pray and let's raise a storm. Amen. And let's beg the Lord to touch hearts. Amen. There are people all across this nation sitting in pews just like this that know the Bible that have been raised in church, that have the financial backing, that have, so, they have a passport that is denied in few countries of the world. And you can step right in. Amen. What do we do? The labors are a few. The harvest is great, and it's only getting bigger. We were talking last night, the world population clock. It's either right past over the 8 billion mark, or it's right about to pass over. We are at the mark of 8 billion What does that do for you? It should break us. Amen. It should break us. 
Father, we do thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be in church tonight. Yes. Lord, I know that these folks came out on a special night, Lord, and it humbles me to know that they have such an interest in missions, such an interest in church, such an interest in uh, even just submitting to leadership and saying, hey, pastor, I'll be there. And Father, what an amazing group tonight. Yes. But Father, help us to not hide behind sometimes a church going, maybe religious appearance of doing. Lord, when a world around us is going to hell. Lord, there's people from all over the world coming to us. We might not agree with it politically. We might not agree with what's happening on the border down south. We might not like the situation with politics, but Lord, the world is coming to us. We don't even have to go to another country nowadays to reach so many people. And yet, Lord, we're still hiding behind excuses so many times. Lord, break our heart into saying genuinely, I want to pray. I want to pray. I want to pray for others. And in the process, I want to pray for myself. And I want to pray for the lost. And I want to pray for those that are working. And I want to pray for those that are out there by themselves among the labor. And, and they're out there among the harvest. And, and, and they're working alone. And maybe they feel like what they're doing is not enough. And, and, and they're getting discouraged. And, and, and they're wearing down. Father, maybe even the pastor here at this church and those that work here, Father, may this church uplift them in prayer. May we start by praying. And then, Father, when you touch our hearts and when you say, hey, you can do more, may we in obedience and submission say, I will go. Father, it's a shame that Jehovah Witness are so far ahead of us in so many countries. Mormons will give two years of their youthhood to go serve as missionaries. So many denominations are willing to give of all they have. And that's that they're walking in falseness. And yet we carry the truth. We walk in the spirit. We know the God of heaven. And we sit comfortable in our chairs without doing more. Help us, Father, to look to you. Help us to submit to your leading. And break our hearts and make us warriors in prayer, if nothing else, tonight. Thank you for this church and thank you for the privilege of being here. May your name be glorified, and we ask it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Pastor. Heads bowed and eyes closed. We've heard a plea given this evening, a plea for prayer, a plea for laborers. I know the Lord convicted my heart. If the Lord has spoken to your heart, I would encourage you this evening to respond. As the music plays, let's all stand to our feet. And while you're standing, if God spoke to your heart, why don't you come? Now's the time, why don't you come?
Where he leads me, I will follow. Thank you, Miss Lydia. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you would seal the things that we have heard into our hearts and minds with the power of your Holy Spirit. We pray this as we ask it in Jesus' name. And amen. You can be seated. We're going to take an offering. Now, I keep forgetting offerings. And my wife told me on Sunday night, you know, I mentioned it to her. I said, I, can't, I think that's the second or third time. I've, I've been here five weeks, and I think I've forgotten two or three offerings already. And she said, well, that's a good sign. It says that your heart's not in the money, right? And so I don't know, but I, I, I want us to take an offering this evening. And I would like to, we've already decided to give uh, a little bit uh, of a love offering as a church to uh, Brother Matt and his family, but I, I would love it if we could take a love offering for him as well. Now, that would be on top of your normal tithes and offerings, and I don't know how exactly you all normally go about it. We'll, I'll work out all the logistics of how we get the money to them. If we don't get it to them tonight, we'll make sure we get it to them. But if there's not a, a family in this world that I would uh, rather support than this family, I don't know who it is, what, a, what, a, what an amazing ministry. And, you know, he mentioned a number of, of monthly support. He's never, he's never gone on deputation. He's never taken the time to travel to churches and try to gain support except for on these furlough trips. He's, he's gained a few new churches that they're allowed to come into, and ours being one of them. Uh, but God has just confirmed his hand upon their ministry by bringing the support to them. You know, Brother Matt said something when I was with them a couple of weeks ago. He said, he said, as far as money is concerned, he said, I, I, I try not to focus on money. I try to focus on the ministry, and the Lord just sends the money along to follow me. I, wow. We, we don't look at things like that usually as Americans, do we? Um, Brother Shields, how many churches would you say you've started between Mexico and Aruba or other ministries over the course of your ministry years? Five churches in about 20 years? That's convicting. That's four churches every... Or let's see, it's it's uh, yeah, four church, uh, one church every every five years, or every four years, and they just go, they just do it, whatever God calls them to, they just do it. Um, I asked him just a second ago if they're if they're paying for any of the church's bills out of out of their monthly support, and the answer is yes. You know, so you hear they're getting five or four thousand dollars a month in support. He also told me earlier, which he didn't mention tonight, that the cost of living there is much higher, much higher, because it's a tourist area, and the the, the taxes are extremely high. Uh, he also didn't mention that he's working three different jobs at times to to help support the ministry. Huh? Good, praise the Lord. But he does whatever he can to to support whenever he needs to to supplement the income because he's just out there serving the Lord. Amen. When are you going back? We have some things to pray about. And uh, I greatly appreciate you all taking the time to come be with us tonight. Amen. I, I, I hope that, you, that, that you'll give until it hurts tonight. Because it'll go to a good place and a good work. Amen. And I hope that you'll give above your normal tithes and offerings. And uh, we'll make sure that, that what comes in, if it's not earmarked on an offering envelope as tither offering, then uh, it goes to them. All right? And that's how we'll do that here this evening. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you would bless the offering tonight. Help us to be a blessing to this dear family and to the work that you've called them to do. We pray this as we ask it in Jesus' name, and amen. We need ushers, don't we? I got so caught up in the, I got so caught up in the ministry, I forgot to call the ushers. 
All right, let's have an offering. That was faster than I expected. All right, wonderful. Uh, well, thank you for coming and being a part of the service this evening. Uh, thank you, Brother and Mrs. Shields and family for, for being with us. Amen. And uh, we'll be in contact, all right? I mean, look, y'all, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm brand new here. I don't know uh, what we can do as far as a missions program is concerned. But I know this, um, uh, you know, if, if the church sets aside money for the pastor to take missions trips, um, we need a ministry like this because I need to go to Aruba. Amen. And so, uh, <laughs> oh, and, and what did you say is the, is the, uh, official language there again? Papiamento. I think some people speak that here. Um, I'm, I'm trying to learn the lingo here. All right. And I haven't learned it yet. So you said it's a conglomeration of all these different languages. All right. So. Uh, there's a lot of that here. You've got northerners, you've got southerners. Everybody kind of came into this region, you know. So we speak Papiamento also, I think. So, uh, all right, let's all stand to our feet. Am I forgetting anything? All right, uh, boy, what a service! How convicting. Amen. So, Lord willing, we'll see you on um, Friday for the homeschool meeting. Uh, Saturday for the men's fish fry. And guys, we need to get there early, I guess, to get to cooking, right? So uh, let's be in communication about that. And then, uh, uh, sun, of course, uh, Saturday as well for soul winning and outreach and, and uh, buses and all that. And then Sunday. If you're glad you've been to, to church tonight, would you say amen? Amen. I know I am. I sure do love you. I hope you have a good longer week than normal. You're dismissed. <laughs>